Hello, welcome to my lecture on the transverse shear stress in beams. So in this lecture, we're going to go a little bit beyond what we've learned in uh, determining the axial stress uh, under a pure bending moment to understanding that she beams actually can develop a healthy component of shear stress that must be taken into account in some cases. Um, so the idea here is that uh, if we have a uniform moment everywhere, the moment is the same everywhere along a beam, uh, then uh, shear does not, does not develop. However, if the moment is, di is different from point to point, in other words, there's the distribution of that moment, it's a function of the position along the beam. If we take the x position as, uh, as a function of x, then this dependence on x for the moment uh, translates to the necessity to develop a shear stress in the beam that must be evaluated. So let's start this uh, process by looking at uh, what we mean by the changes in moment along x translates into uh, a necessity to find the shear stress. So in this case, I have, uh, we're going to consider uh, looking back at uh, what we've learned in uh, beam theory. Uh, so far, we've learned that uh, the, um, uh, we have the load uh, distribution is Q as a function of X, and uh, the shear force distribution is V as a function of X, and the moment distribution is M as a function of X. And uh, therefore, we also learned that um, V is essentially dm by dx. So it is the gradient uh, of the moment along the beam. Also, similarly, Q is the gradient of V with respect to x. In other words, if m is really a function of x, then then we must develop V, which is a shear force that should be taken into account in computing um, the balance of the beam. So if you look at it, I have, let's say, a cross section like this. And the cross section uh, on this side, we have a moment. And I have also a shear force that uh, is acting on the beam V and on this side I have uh, so if this distance is dx then we get the moment is different by an amount dm and the shear force is different by the amount dv because they both depend on x and we moved a distance delta x so this kind of uh, distribution of uh, forces will result in the need to balance them in a special way. So let me look at how we're going to do that here. So here I have um, a section of the beam. So I have M plus DM and V plus DV. And, um, and on this side, I have M and V. So on this side, if I look at the stress distribution, it is uh, going to be compressive on the top. So the arrows are going inward and is equal to minus M Y over I. So it's linear and it will be tensile on the bottom. And uh, this, the bottom is the mirror image of the top. Now, if we go to the right hand side, the situation is a little bit different. So the size of the arrows on the right hand side will be somewhat different from the arrows on the left side because the moment is not exactly the same. It's, uh, ch it's changed by an amount dm. So I have to add that amount to my balance. So if suppose now that you cut the beam along this plane, if you cut it along this plane and look at this block, which is on, away from the neutral axis, so neutral axis, the top surface of the block is a distance c from the neutral axis. Then this block is going to look on its side like that. 
and uh, the block will have an excess force on the right side that is not balanced by the left side. In other words, the arrows on the left will balance everything on the right except for the excess force, which is dm times y over i. So that stress dm times y over i must be integrated over that phase and the integration of that will give me a force and I don't know what to do with this force. So the only way I can balance this force is to have a shear on the bottom surface of the block tau such that the shear force uh, generated on the bottom of the block would be equal to this total force F. In other words, equilibrium, which is what we have here, is tau times B times DX. This is tau times the area, should be equal to the total force on the right. And the total force on the right, I have, um, I, if I take DX downstairs, I have DM by DX, and note for DM by DX, I have it here so if I just, let's see, um, if I write that tau b, so I have here tau b dx equals to the integral of dm y over i uh, dy. So this integral is from the position, so let's go back here. So integral is from the position y1 to c. So I have to put the integral here from y1 to c. So if I take dx and put it downstairs here, I can write this equation tau b equals to, uh, let's say I can take 1 over i out, and then I have integral from y1 to c, and then I have dm by dx, and then I have y dy. So that will give me uh, tau, an expression of tau as 1 over i times b. And then dm by dx, as we've learned now, is actually the vertical shear force v, which we can, it's not a function of y, it's a function of x. So we can take it out of the integral. And then I have the integral y1 to c of y dy. So if you look at this equation, I have the equation is telling me that tau is equal to v over ib times this integral. So this integral I'm going to call it q, where q is a special integral of the area from y1 to c of y dy. And uh, if we look back here, it's y dy, and um, therefore it has this um, fee, uh, idea, This you have the integration is an area, basically. Uh, it's a moment of the area, and therefore we can, we're going to start looking at it as a moment of the area. So if you have y dy in here, then you can call it, um, Q. So we're going to call Q as the accumulation of the area. Let's see, we have here um, the uh, YDA. And uh, in, in my analysis here, I just have this as it should be YDA because I'm integrating over the area and I go back here and I make the correction here, this will be YDA as the integration over the area. And then this is also corrected to YDA. And uh, that actually gives me the entire uh, distribution of um, the shear stress. If I know Q then I should be able to find the shear stress uh, at any location of the beam as VQ over IB. So let's go back here and uh, we uh, have 
this balance giving us uh, tau equals VQ over IB. Then we're going to pay attention to what Q is. It's an integral of, of the area of Y times DA. Y times DA is like taking the moment of a small area DA times Y. The arm length is Y. And uh, taking that from Y1 to C. So what will happen is that we will take, this will be equal to like an average value of Y. We're going to call it Y bar. Uh, and if I integrate, then I integrate the dA gives me A. In other words, I will just have, if I am interested at Q value for this area from Y1 all the way to C, I must calculate the area first, which is A prime, which is the area from the top fiber up to the surface of interest where, where I want to have the shear. And I must also find the centroid of that area, which would be somewhere in here. And then multiple centroid, how far away from the neutral axis, that is the Y bar. Then I take this area and multiply by the distance away from the neutral uh, axis. That's the first moment of the area and that gives me Q. So let's take a, an example now of uh, how to compute that for a rectangular cross-section. So for a rectangular cross-section, the integration can be done uh, in a, very simply without having to worry about centroid. It's just y dA. dA is b times dy. And d, y dy is y squared over 2. So you get b over 2 times c squared minus y1 squared. So if I look at... Um, this uh, particular equation, then I see that I have, I can split it into uh, two parts, as I'll show you here in a second, to give you a meaning uh, of the uh, equation. So Q is equal to B times C minus Y1 times C plus Y1, and that I can write it as B times c plus y1 over 2 times c minus y1. So um, the uh, location, the this is y bar essentially. This is the distance uh, from of the centroid of the area from the neutral axis. And uh, the product that I see here of b times c minus y1 is the area. So this is the area A prime. So I can also write this Q as Y bar uh, prime times the area A prime, which is the form that is convenient for calculations. So it's either that we do it by integration, if we know how to do the integration right away, or we use the formula that we used before, that it is equal to Y bar times prime times A prime as I showed you uh, in this uh, in the notes. So with that, when I substitute back, the interesting thing that I note is that the shear stress is uh, dependent on y1 to the power 2. So it is kind of a parabolic in the value of y1. When y1 is equal to c, then the shear is equal to 0. When y1 is equal to 0, then the shear becomes maximum. So the par the shear distribution is a parabola and is a maximum at the center and the maximum is 3 times V over 2A, which is greater than the average. The average is just the V over A. If I compute it, I have a shear force V and then I have an area A, so it'd be V over A, but here is one and a half times, so it goes up one and a half times in the center of the beam. So that's kind of a nice result. Now we can extend it for different shapes, but we're not going to do the integrations. We just uh, learn how to get the results from the table here. So in rectangular, we talked about this 3V over 2A, while well, the average V over A. Uh, hollow, thin, walled, round section. Average is again V over A, but the maximum here is two times. Uh, so it's even worse than the case of a rectangular. Uh, the circular, the uh, maximum is 1.3 times, so it's 4 over 3. And then finally, 
we have a structural I-beam with a thin walled web. Uh, what happens is that uh, because the web becomes very thin, then the shear stress rises to a large value and we will compute that exactly in the next uh, example but for quick design applications we can compute the the shear stress in the web to be the largest because the area of the web is small much smaller than the area of the flange so it is v divided by the area of the web and we kind of do not take into account the contributions to of the flanges so that will be kind of a conservative quick way to find the maximum shear stress in the beam so um, let's uh, just now discuss uh, what we're going to have what kind of application we will have what we'll do is uh, we wanted to find out the importance of the transverse shear is it important in failure of beams that's number one question the second question is that uh, if I have a, an I-beam, for example, and I want to determine the shear stress distribution, how can I do that uh, if, because the I-beam cross-section is uh, a little bit complex and I need to kind of figure out how to do the shear distribution? So to answer the first question, we're going to look at the uh, problem uh, that we have now stress state at every point in the beam that has two, two types of stresses. One is a normal stress in the x-direction, sigma. This results from the bending. We don't have a stress in the y-direction, but we have a shear stress that comes from transverse shear. So the 2D stress tensor has only two components, and the third one is zero. However, we know now by more circle and by 2D stress transformations that we can find the value of the maximum shear stress as a result of that distribution, and that's the one that can cause failure. So let's uh, see uh, how that works. In this case, I have tau max from the more circle is square root of sigma over 2 squared plus tau squared. And uh, if I introduce now what I've learned, my over i and vq over ib for a rectangular cross section, um, and uh, the, the beam has a length l and, uh, and the depth h, um, then we find that uh, for a cantilever beam, that the maximum stress, the sh maximum shear stress is a function of L over H. So as the beam gets longer and longer, uh, then it'd be really slender, and uh, the contribution of the shear of the uh, ver uh, transverse shear becomes less important um, to the maximum stress. So this kind of a transition point here depends on uh, how uh, thick is the beam where the transverse stress becomes uh, contribution becomes important. So let's uh, see how this works in um, an actual example. So in this example, I have a beam 12 inches long, and it's supporting a load 488 pound force, and it's acting three inches from the left support. And the beam has an eye cross section, eye beam cross section, 2.33 inches flange width and the beam depth is three inches and the uh, and then the web has a width of 0.17 and the flange has a thickness of 0.26 so we're going to approximate this we're going to forget about the radius of curvatures here which are used to kind of reduce the stress concentrations and and use the idealized cross section on the right and what we want is that we want to take points d at the top c at the uh, plane between the flange and the web B at the same plane but below it a little bit below it so it is in the web and A is in the middle of the web and we want to determine the profile of the transverse shear stress uh, and the bending stress at every point and the maximum shear at every point very good example first is uh, computation of the second moment of inertia. So if we look at this, the second moment of inertia, I can compute it for as a big rectangle, 
here and then I subtract two small rectangles one to the right and then the other one is going to be to the left and each one is bh cubed over 12 so for each each one has its own b so the big rectangle the b is 2.33 h is 3 and this is 12. the small rectangles i have two of them uh, each one has a b of 1 and h is 2.48 so that gives me the total moment of inertia. I put this in, on the side. And then I move on <coughs> to um, determining the uh, moment distribution along the beam. If I don't have a moment distribution, if the moment is uniform, there's no shear. Okay, But the beam actually has a point force, and uh, therefore I can find the two uh, reactions that support the point force, 366, 122, and from these two I can draw the shear force diagram and the bending moment diagram as you can see in here. So I have a bending moment diagram that uh, starts linear up to the maximum of 1098 at 3 inches from the left side and it goes down to zero because of simple support. So the gradients in that moment or the derivatives will generate the shear, which is what you can see here. This is a shear, this is a shear. So there must be a transverse shear stress. So before I find the transverse shear stress, I have to find uh, the corresponding uh, areas. So if I look at point D, for example, it's on the top. So above the plane is what we're interested in. So above the plane that is passing through D, there is no material, so the QD is zero. But if I go to C, I have this whole rectangle above the C, and the rectangle has an area of 2.33 times 2.26, and its center is somewhere here. This center, if I calculate the distance between the center of this rectangle to the neutral axis, I find it to be 1.24 plus half of that 0.26, which is here. This is the y bar, and this is the area. And then if I need now to calculate the Q for A, it has to carry two rectangles. One rectangle is a very thin and tall one, and the other rectangle is the one that is flat, and uh, we computed that before. So the QA is going to have two parts. One part is what we computed already for the uh, horizontal rectangle and then we have to compute another part for the vertical rectangle. This is the area and this is the distance off of the neutral axis for that rectangle and therefore I get the Q sub A. So now I'm ready to because I found the shears and the point of interest is going to be right here because this is the maximum and therefore I can compute V, which is 366 at this point, 366. You're going to have to take it to the left or the right. So if I take it to the left, it's going to be larger, which is 366, and uh, Q, and then I have I, B. Notice that the I is for the total section, but the B is for each point. So B for point A is very small. 0.17, so you get a very high stress. B for point B is still small, but the Q is smaller, so it goes down. P, B for point C is large, 2.33, so the stress immediately drops down, and for point D it goes to zero. So it results in a very stre nice stress distribution that we get to have zero at the top fiber and then at uh, the interface uh, on plane C, we have now um, a uh, tau sub C is 52. And then all of a sudden, if we just cross that plane, then we get a tau that is very large, but it's 750. And then you accumulate a little bit more, and therefore the maximum shear is right at the center. So now we need to figure out what is the bending stress at point C and D and B and A. 
and the bending is m times y over a over i so we substitute for the y's so at point a this is the y this is a neutral axis this is the distance off the neutral axis and so forth so in this case we get bending stress to be zero at the neutral axis at the interface is minus five four five at the top and the bottom is six minus six five nine psi so this amount has to be accounted for with the shear in order for me to find the maximum shear stress so max tau maximum square root of sigma over two square plus tau square this is using the more circle idea and therefore when we do that we find that tau maximum is essentially the largest at point a in all of this so if you look back here at point a is the mi middle point and the middle point is essentially has the largest shear stress although point d has the largest tensile stress so this is the moral of the story is that if you have a very thin web uh, in the uh, in that example uh, where we have uh, the uh, uh, web is becomes very thin uh, then it immediately raises a flag that uh, shear stresses could be significant because the web cannot carry all of the tensile stress by itself and then if you have variations on each side of the moments then that generates a shear and the shear has to be taken into account as very significant so if a, if a flange if a, an i-beam has to fail so yeah when you design i-beam the web thickness cannot be too thin uh, of course if you make it thinner then you save material but if it is too thin then the shear stress can be significant and therefore can lead to uh, potentially can lead to failure uh, of the i-beam and with that i think we're going to stop because we covered the shear stresses uh, and bending stresses 